to get started. Welcome everyone. This is our third Division 56 invited plenary uh, talk for this conference. Division 56 is Trauma Psychology Division. I'm Dr. Chris Courtois, the current president of the division. And we're always starting our talks with an invitation to join us and become a member of the division. We have um, membership applications here and also some information about our journal. Um, later this afternoon also we will be having our business meeting and I'll be giving a presidential address on incest as complex trauma. Um, that's in room 101, so please join us for that. Um, I, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Pat Crittenden, who is um, joining us today um, and telling us about her research and its application. Dr. Crittenden is a graduate of the University of Virginia. She started under Mary Ainsworth, where she developed the DMM, developed maturational model of attachment and adaptation. She works in integrating theory, empirical research, and, and clinical, um, the clinical material to change. Um, and I can't read my writing. <laughs> uh, clinical practice to change how we view um, disorders um, and how we think about disorders. Um, she has two recent books, Raising Parents, that has received a lot of acclaim, and our recent book, uh, Assessing Adult Attachment, published by Norton. And she is holding an IASA conference in Miami, if you'd like more information, and that will come in 2014. So, Dr. Crittenton, we are very delighted to have you, and um, we are excited about what you're going to present to us today. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. We're a small enough group that, although I've timed every single word that I'm going to say, we can loosen up. And if things don't make sense or you want to ask or say something, just signal. And if I think I can fit it in, I will. Otherwise, I might move on. But feel free to do that. OK? Um, I want to give you a dynamic maturational perspective on danger, attachment, and adaptation. There are really two versions of attachment theory. One has to do with the good bees and the bad everything else's, of which the worst is disorganized. And the DMM, which goes back to Bowlby's idea that attachment was about survival, not secure attachment, just attachment being about survival. So we find adaptive value in all patterns. So today, I want to talk about how DMM attachment theory is related to trauma, give you a little look at some empirical findings, and then, this is what I wish to do the most, offer you an illustrative case, because after I wrote the abstract, I had come into my hands a video that is to die for. You don't expect to get these videos. And I got it, and I want to share it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then something on the treatment applications. I'm offering you a strengths approach to trauma, as opposed to an illness approach, in which the main thought is that exposure to danger is an opportunity to learn essential information about survival. Danger's universal. It's not an aberration. Something didn't go wrong. Every single life has danger, and we are evolved to survive it. Danger is an event, whereas psychological trauma is one response to danger. And that difference <laughs> will follow through my work. Psychological trauma, or trauma, isn't the danger, it's one response to the danger. Some people exposed to the same danger are traumatized. So I'll differentiate the event of danger from the psychological response of trauma. Pointing out that not everyone is, a, oh, second point, psychological pain 
just like physical pain, signals that there is something you need to attend to. There's something to learn. Something's out of place. So when I hear that the effort is to get rid of the symptom, my question is, but did you already learn from that symptom? Do you know what it's signaling to you? Or are you just getting rid of, rid of the discomfort? And of course, the underlying issue is why do some people have a traumatic response, whereas others, in response to the same danger, are frightened or upset and recovery? The outcomes of psychological trauma are unnecessary reenactment of the traumatizing event or excessive anxiety about unlikely future endangerment. So the dynamic maturational model that I'm going to phrase as DMM is a theory about the effects of danger on self-protection partner protection, and child protection. Because we die as a species if large numbers of us cannot protect ourselves to reproductive maturity, cannot protect our partner through the raising of our children, and cannot protect our children to their reproductive maturity. These are simply core experiences. I'm not going to talk about sex. Although a Swedish psychologist said of me, she is the person in attachment who talks about danger and sex. And I do love sex. But, but we're not doing sex today. Um, development enables individuals to learn to manage a wide array of dangers. Our, our infants arrive unable to protect themselves. Development is the opportunity through gradual exposure to a wider range of dangers to become competent. So, the brain is evolved to give preferential attention to danger and sex <laughs> through two opposite processing routes. One is a cerebellar cognitive route that is based on the temporal order in which the information reaches the brain. And everything that you know in learning theory refers to this kind of information. The other is a limbic affective route, which responds to the intensity of the stimulation. It's the number of neurons that are responding, the rapidity of the response, as opposed to the temporal order of the response. So I'm arguing that the brain receiving sensory stimulation makes two kinds of meaning from it, one temporally ordered, one intensity based. And that all of that happens at the pre-conscious, implicit level. It happens from birth on, but some of that information can move forward to verbal processing and some of that information can be integrated episodically and thought about reflectively, which gives us a model of multiple dispositional representations. That is, I am assuming that each person is disposed in multiple ways in any given moment, as opposed to the attachment idea of a single internal working model. I don't think that fits the data very well. Here's what the model looks like now. We have physiological somatic representations, temporally ordered cognitive representations, and intensity-based affective representations. Some of them are implicit, without words, and they are formed and dispose behavior very rapidly. If you're facing an immediate and substantial danger, you don't have time to waste, this gets a self-protective response out and functioning long before you could name it or think about it. You're already running when you say, I heard a loud sound. But you can say, I heard a loud sound, and that's now a verbal representation of the same information. It can be held in a body state, 
it can be held in a generalized semantic way, if this happens, then that, or it can be held in the connotative language with which you describe the event. If you have even more time, and you're willing to use up an awful lot of the processing potential of your brain, you can put the whole thing together to recreate episodes, oops, and you might even pause to think about it, to reflect upon it. That structuring leads to three self-protective strategies that come out of attachment. The cognitive type A's behave so as to avoid the danger. The affective type C's fight or struggle with the danger. And the balanced integrative B's consider the nature of the danger, the possible responses, and in most cases, they resolve the danger. That's the long route, and it takes longer to implement. This is how the model looks in adulthood. I'm, I'm very color-coded. You see the reds, the greens, the blues. Track them. Here they come. The balanced Bs up here, the avoidant As, the affectively intense Cs. This model on the outside is the information processing that underlies this behavioral model, and I don't have time to talk about it, but I want to say that one of the strengths of this model is that it first exists in information processing, and that is then affecting behavior. So children cannot manage most dangers. They need attachment figures to protect and comfort them in the child's zone of proximal development. And that ZPD is crucial for raising children or dealing with patients or clients. The attachment figure, usually a parent or the therapist, lets the child do for himself what he can do for himself. You don't help someone who's competent. They help him to learn what he is ready to learn and they protect and comfort the child when the child cannot manage the problem at all. So you don't do for a child who can do, you help a child in their zone of proximal development, and you do for the child what they are not ready to learn at all. For type A children, the parents were not in the zone of proximal development, they expected too much, and they punished failure and the display of negative feelings. And the child learns to avoid showing negative feelings and to organize his behavior so as not to fail, if at all possible. Overachievers are often in this group. Anxious, American, compulsive overachievers. Um, type C children have parents that intermittently and unpredictably rewarded immature negative behavior which is also often the expression of negative affect. Psychological trauma, or danger, creates the opportunity to learn to protect and comfort the self across the course of childhood and well into adulthood for many of us. Unprotected and uncomforted children use shortcuts that omit the incomprehensible information. What they can't understand, they ditch, and they create the best rule they can out of the information that they can manage. For the information that they can't manage, they tuck it away in little corners of the mind where it won't disrupt them, but it can be found later. And I am going to argue that some of what you see in adult traumatization is these bits of old information that the mind has selectively retained popping up at a moment when the adult could use it. So the associative processes are underway. They're retrieving the information that has sat unviewed for sometimes decades. I'm also going to propose that maturation creates the opportunity for children and the adults they become to reorganize their dis 
positional representations, often with an attachment figure's help. Dad dies in infancy. The kid can't manage that. Whatever information there is get tucked, gets tucked away in corners. Mom can't manage it, so there's no help now. She's desperate. The kid is left to figure it out on his own. In the preschool years, there is a chance that the child will be able to make some meanings of the past event that he could not make in infancy, but that will best occur if mother can go back and review this with him. And now some meanings around dad's death can possibly be made. But maybe mom's moved on. Maybe she doesn't want to go back there. She's just fallen in love. She's just packaged it up. It's the wrong timing for her. It's an opportunity for her child. Maybe she doesn't get back there and do it. But maybe when the child has more maturation in the school years and she's comfortable in this new marriage, maybe then she can afford to go back. Plug in? I thought I was plugged in. I don't see anything. I am plugged in, and power isn't working. Thank you. Um, and it does. It does help to have some help. That was, I think, my point. Um, so why is this thing really bleeping along? I think I'm going to have another problem in a minute. I just don't know what it is. This tells me it's coming. Um, this is the infant model. It's the infant can deal with true information that looks like what it means and you have some A's, B's, and C's. Here's where the kids are who have information they can't deal with, and I acknowledge them as A plus, A, C, and C plus. <laughs> Preschool years, children learn to use affect to mislead other people. They look happy when they are angry. They look very, very angry when they're only irritated. They are able to do elegant things with the display of affect to change the viewer's behavior. In the school years, they become able to deceive with words. They can tell you one thing and convince you of it and do the opposite. In adolescence, sex shows up and it changes everything. It's like making the world technicolor. All the strategies are adopted to incorporate sexuality. And you get this new pattern of being able to go on on your own without an attachment figure. And before late adolescence, you really can't survive without an attachment figure. So here comes compulsive self-reliance. A prominent American pattern as well. There are cultural differences in the distributions of the patterns. So I pointed to two that are more frequent in the United States than they are in other cult cultures. Um, compulsive performance and compulsive self-reliance. Nice colonial pioneer background here. Um, so I want to propose that unprotected and uncomforted danger in childhood combined with lack of reorganization during <laughs> development creates psychological trauma in childhood and predisposes adults to PTSD from danger that occurs in adulthood. So this trauma that came from childhood predisposes an individual to psychological trauma in adulthood when exposed to dangers that have some similarity with that past childhood danger. So I'm going to show you very briefly three empirical findings. I'm okay with empirical work. I'm much better with theory. I do what I do well. Adults with chronic PTSD uniformly had unresolved childhood traumas 
and other patients in psychotherapy did not, and normative individuals without psychotherapy did not. This group stood out. Most of the traumas were in a dismissed form. That is, the person dismissed the effects of the danger upon themselves. They displaced their feelings onto someone or something else. They blocked the event from recall, or having recalled it, they denied the event. And they made delusional repairs. The adult traumas were all tied to some kind, in, in some way, to the childhood trauma. That is, the mind was connecting related information. We have one paper out that touches this, Crittenden and Newman, and Crittenden and Heller is hunting for its home. In the DMM, we have 12 different kinds of unresolved trauma. I'm not going to talk about these. I just want to give you a minute to look at the list so that you can say, oh yes, I have a patient who imagined a trauma, but there wasn't evidence. I have a patient who reacted to her mother's trauma, but it wasn't her own, it was vicarious. Just want you to see how we divide that space up. So, now I'm going to move to our source of data, which is adult attachment interviews. It's a one hour semi-structured interview about childhood danger, protection from that danger in childhood, and comfort if things were distressing. The discourse analysis that we apply yields the self-protective ABC attachment strategy, that circle that I've been showing you, and it yields the unresolved traumas in childhood and the type of distortion, those 12 that I just showed you. I'm going to give you now two excerpts from Cecilia's adult attachment interview. She was asked about her relationship with her mother, and she said it was distant. When I say distant, it's like she had this boyfriend, Big Bob, who was lovely, and he used to go, he had kids with another woman, and he used to go and see them every single Sunday. And the way I say mean by distant is that particular, one particular Sunday, she decided my mom decided not to come back. <coughs> so Big Bob couldn't go to and see his kids because he wouldn't leave us. And he hadn't been with my mom that long and my mom decided not to come back. So I sort of mean that by distant it was the fact that sometimes she wasn't there. And I don't remember it personally in a way. It's from what I've been told by Big Bob because he <coughs> he er, is, is friends with my uncle. And he came around and he was like, yeah, well, I wouldn't have left your mom, but she didn't come back till for, <coughs> th uh, th Tuesday. And I went, right. And she goes, and he had left, left you for like three nights or whatever. Because she went out on the Friday and came back on the Tuesday. Or I was like, right. She goes, he knew. She knew I was meant to be seeing my kids on the Sunday, and she never came back when she promised she would. Er, and she had left him, apparently, with no money, and there was hardly any food in the house. So, well, you get the big picture, but there are parts of this discourse that are not clear, and you don't know exactly what was said. Our argument is that where there is disfluent, the mind has more than one dispositional representation in mind. It remembers it temporally, but it also has a different affective response. Here is the reflected one, here's my body. And they're in the mind and active at one moment, and the tongue gets confused about which one it should be speaking, and we see it as disfluence. So using that idea, I have put in red the way we annotate this discourse. When I say distant, it's like she had this boyfriend, this boyfriend, distancing. Big Bob, who was lovely, and she idealizes. 
He used to go to, and she's disfluent about saying that he had other gifts. And he used to go and see them every single Sunday. And she emphasizes his faithfulness to his children. And the way I say, mean by distant is, that particular, she's disfluent, one particular Sunday she decide, my mom decided, disfluent again about the mother's departure, not to come back. So Big Bob couldn't, she displaces the effect of abandonment onto Big Bob's problem, not talking about her own. And he hadn't been with my uh, mom that long, and my mom decided not to come back. And she just stops there and tells us nothing more about it. So I sort of mean that by distant, and the fact distancing, that sometimes minimizing, she just wasn't there for me. Wasn't there for me, the unspoken words. And I don't remember it personally in a way. It's from what I've been told by Big Bob, because he, uh, 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 friends, very disfluent about Big Bob in her life. Yeah, well, I wouldn't have left your mom, but she didn't come back until the, uh, the Thursday, no, or Tuesday. Very, very disfluent about the length of the mother's absent, absence. And it's speech. Somebody's talking now. It's getting living. And I went, right, that speech. She goes, present tense. All of a sudden, we're losing track of time. And she had left you for like three nights or whatever, dismissing, because she went out on the Friday, came back on the Tuesday, and repeats this important information of how long she was left. And I was like, right, and she goes, he knew. There's confusion of time and person. Who knew what and when, and when is it now? Is it happening again? She knew I was meant to be seeing my kids on the Sunday, and she never came back, and speech. Or, and she had left him, look at the displacement, with no money, and there was hardly any food in the house, so. So I was abandoned to a strange man, and had no one else to take care of me. She didn't say that, but that's implicit in what was said. We give this a you, unresolved trauma, in a displaced and dismissed form with regard to abandonment by the mother. That will be part of the ultimate classification. One other little bit. Like my mom and my stepdad would argue and fight. And we had a dog who was gorgeous. And she was very nervous around loud noises. And they would start fighting. And she would be shaking behind the sofa. And I would go, Mom, you're scaring the dog. And they would go, get her the fuck out of here then. So I would end up having to take the dog for like a two-hour walk or whatever because they were arguing. Here's the analysis. Like my mom and stepdad would argue and fight and we had a dog who was gorgeous. Why are we talking about the dog? <laughs> <laughs> and she was very nervous around loud noises. She displaces her own distress onto the dog and they would start fighting now it's the present participle. This is getting closer to now. And she would be shaking both the present participle and the displacement to the dog behind the sofa. And I would go, Mom, you are scaring the dog. Speech and displacement of caregiving to the dog. And they would go, get the fuck out of here. Violent with scatological speech. And so I would end up having to take the dog for like a two-hour walk or whatever, dismissed, because they were arguing. And the dog functions as a means of escape from an almost present tense danger. And we're going to give that a you trauma displaced regarding the marital fights. So overall, when you take the whole AAI, we get unresolved trauma regarding abandonment and marital fighting in an affect-denying, compulsive A cognitive strategy, when you take the whole AAI. And here's 
the video that I'm going to show you. I want you to look for this particular moment. The video is only 30 seconds long. I want you to look for this moment and gather as much information about it as you can. Oh my god, I don't have a sound cable. Uh -huh. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> if I can rip things out of the floor. <laughs> I hope this is a sound cable. The heaviest, most awkward sound cable I've ever seen. But I think that it must sounds be. like it. <laughs> All right. Here we go. This is, of course, Cecilia, the same woman we've been reading about. questions. Did the baby hit Cecilia aggressively? No. no. Did he hurt her? Yes. I think even if he had knives on his fingernails, he could not possibly have hurt her with this little move. Did Cecilia perceive pain? Yes, she perceived pain. Was she expecting to be hit? Uh, now we need some information that we have in our adult attachment interview, and you've seen it, but we don't have it in the video. This is a delusion. This is what makes this video so incredibly powerful. We see an actual delusion of a mother imagining that her boy had hit her and hurt her and she is reacting with perceived pain. But he didn't behave aggressively, and he didn't, couldn't have hurt her. But the pain is there. This is a delusion. You don't often catch it on film. What consequence did she give her son for hitting her and hurting her? She kissed him. And that makes a huge amount of difference. Think back to the history of her abandonment when her mother disappears and Big Bob being the only one who is there and the dog being frightened when the parents fight. We give this a huge trauma with a delusional repair for males hitting women. And we see her make the same slip that she made in the AAI of confusing people. This is a baby. He's being confused with men. And time. She's a mother and it's now. But in her mind, the representation coming up is about being a child or watching her mother being hit by men. She's slipping between people and times and responding with an inappropriate representation to her son. Cecilia's history. A sibling died of shaken baby syndrome. 
She had seven hospitalizations in her first year of life, 29 by the time she was 18. Multiple abandonments, the mother's boyfriends took care of her on these occasions, and they also sexually abused her. There's the affection piece. What do you do to keep a man with you when you really, really need him because you'll die on the streets without food or shelter if you don't have him? And the baby's father is in prison for partner violence to a previous partner. Look how she chooses her partners, not so differently from her mother. But there is risk to Cecilia's son, who in our videotape is unaware of any of this stuff happening behind him. He didn't intend anything, he didn't perceive anything, he doesn't know his mother's reaction. But she treats it as aggression. I think over time he may learn that aggression is approved of and that it elicits love. If she does this enough, maybe the aggression will become intentional. And what will that mean for his relationships with other children in school or for girls and women later? I'm worried that Cecilia's delusional repair of trauma could be creating a bully or a violent husband or both. If we want to use her trauma productively, we have to think, what does Cecilia need to know that this behavior is signaling? Well, she needs to understand that intimacy with males was important for her survival in childhood, and she would do what she had to do to survive. But that her context with her son is not like that of Big Bob or her boyfriend. She needs to separate these and see that her son is a baby and he needs her in the attachment figure role, not in the vulnerable role of needing to be cared for. And so the question becomes, how can we help her to discover and use this information? I offer six implications. We need a self context, safe context to carry out the treatment. If she's being beaten at the time, we're going to have a hard time managing the treatment. And if she doesn't feel safe with us, we're going to have a hard time managing the treatment. Safety first, treatment later. And we need to work in her zone of proximal development to protect and comfort her as a transitional attachment figure, building the bridge from her world of pain and fear to our world where we believe it is safe, but she knows, of course, there's never been any safety. We need to focus on her adaptation in the past and how valuable what she did was for herself, how it kept her alive to give her a present but how the current situation is different. And then we need to keep in mind that opposite ABC strategies may need opposite treatments. She may not need treatment for PTSD. She may need treatment for dismissed kinds of trauma in a type A affect denying, self-denying strategy. And if we give her treatments, that are meant for affect arousing type C's, other blaming type C's, we could augment the problem. A and C have been structured as psychological opposites. So if we give the wrong treatment, I'll just stick in, I think we habitually do this to sexual abusers. We give them a treatment attuned to our notion of the problem, but not their strategy and we reinforce the strategy, and then we decide there's nothing we can do for them. Just a little provocative idea. <laughs> uh, choosing the techniques. Well, we need a functional formulation of the symptoms. What are those symptoms doing? And then we need treatment techniques that are suited to the A or the C type of strategy, so that we first make sure we don't give a harmful treatment. And then we need person-specific treatment plans. That's five. Number six is consider the client's children. 
data that we have coming but are not ready for publication yet show that the children of parents with psychological disorders are uniformly in trouble and their adult therapist does not know it and cannot see it. They, they usually don't even see the child, but the parent cannot tell the story. Really, really worry about the children of your adult clients. Oh, I've done very well. I'm completely within time and we can <laughs> talk. Um, I think the mind has an amazing capacity to retain information that is relevant to danger and comfort and sex. And to protect the self, the mind disassociates some bits of information that are too threatening and it tucks them away. And it over-associates other bits of information to retain vigilance for the possibility of danger. The brain can only do two things with information. It can put it together or keep it apart. That's all it can do. Those are the only meanings it can make. This and this are connected, this and this are not connected. And disassociation is when we have decided it is safest for ourselves to keep the information apart. But that changes with development. There is a time in the presence of a supportive person when one can put the information back together and make meaning. And the mind frames information in evocative and metaphorical terms, dogs shaking behind sofas, that ensure that the emotional meaning is retained without explicit awareness. Having that information allows Cecilia to remember the arousal without becoming aroused while she remembers, and she can stay within strategy doing what she needs to do to stay safe. Development, reflection, and sometimes treatment offer ways forward, especially with the help of a protective attachment figure, either someone in your real life or a transitional attachment figure as a therapist. If I was provocative enough to intrigue you about the dynamic maturational model, this book is out, Raising Parents. And if you were interested in the discourse analysis, this book came out just in June, Assessing Adult Attachment. It can be used with adult attachment interviews, but also other narrative procedures if they access more than one representational system. And I say that because I've been attending a number of these talks and I've seen that for narratives, most of what is presented is out of verbal semantic memory. And it is not imaged memory, it's not procedural memory, it's not body memory. You really have to get at multiple representations to use this method and not be satisfied with the shorthand of a generalized verbal statement. The, the journal, um, Journal of Clinical Child Psychology and Psychiatry, in 2010, ran a special issue that is all DMM studies. If you're interested in it, it can be downloaded at no cost until August 31st, and this is the link. I will be posting um, this PowerPoint both on my own web address, patcrittenden.com, tricky, tricky, patcrittenden.com, and on the APA site. But I don't have all the little passwords and such for the APA site yet, so it isn't there. I do for mine, it'll soon be there. Um, and, and then you can get all of that information. I want to close with words that are wiser than mine. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight, the truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, 
The truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. And I would argue that that circuitous route that holds the information and tells the truth, but doesn't destroy the child who's had to experience more than they can manage, is what we're looking at when we get adult discourse from traumatized individuals. Okay. I'm two minutes early by my clock, so we have time for questions and discussion. Yes. Uh, I'll, I thought I'd do this. There's my email address, if you want that. And I would be glad to send you the presentation if you ask for it that way. patcrittenden.com has a bunch of papers and models and all kinds of things you can download, and this will go up shortly. With your permission, Pat, we'll also post these slides on the Division 56 website, Absolutely. along with a recorded version of the talk. My pleasure. Would you send me the recorded version? It'll be on the 56 website. Oh, I can download it. All right. Oh, I'm pleased. Oh, if you told me that, I'd have been all shaken up. Webmaster Superior. Yes. Can you say a little bit more about um, this caution that if someone is more dismissing or <coughs> the other end, um, the therapist goes about the, the opposite strategies requiring the opposite treatments. So, in other words, if someone's more dismissing and all of that, one should use a more emotional. Um, one should use an affect opening. Okay. Um, treatment and not a treatment that is based on verbal generalizations, not on taking responsibility for your own behavior. These folks already do that already. They take all their responsibility and the other person's. So you don't want to be doing that sort of thing, which is the problem with many sexual abusers. They're a delusional type A and they already take too much of the responsibility. They're dramatically ashamed of themselves. And when we give them the forms of CBT that say, take the child's perspective, try to imagine how the child, the dog for Cecilia, the other person felt, they're moved away from their own feelings, which is the thing they need to know about. On the other hand, if they are already an affectively um, intense person, over the top, always in anxiety mode, always in a crisis, they need to go back and understand someone else's perspective, not just their own. They need to accept responsibility, not blame. They need to have affect um, reducing interventions and interventions that get them into that state of arousal between how they come in and depress down here, this middle state of alert and comfortable that lets you think. Because it's in that state that they can begin to get access to the cognitive information that they probably don't have access to. Do I make sense? It's my, pro it's my problem with DSM diagnoses that are diagnoses of symptoms, but not of the information processing that underlies them. And so a treatment which may be successful enough to give you a significant outcome may also be harmful to a subset of the people with that diagnosis, and we don't see that effect. Nobody ever asks if it's harmful. We ask only if it did good. I don't know how we got past that little ethical thing. You can't with drugs. You give a drug, you have to look for negative effects. I don't know why we think that when you try to change the mind without a drug, you don't need to look for negative effects. Yeah? Thank you for such a uh, rich and useful organization. Well, it's really very helpful. 
I wonder if you could say a few more words. I'm a little, uh, it's hard for me to imagine how you conceptualize the like a typical therapy session with you. Are you working on interpretation, on, on skills, on in the in the room, uh, relational? What What do you do? Ah, the first the first thing is assessing. Before I start mucking around with somebody's brain, I want to know how they're organized, what threats they've experienced, how they react to those. I want something like that adult attachment interview that doesn't give me the symptoms, but tells me how the individual is organized. That will allow me to find my most likely helpful stance in regard to them. It'll help me to find that zone of proximal development. Are they speaking all in semantic distancing terms? Are they all in arousal? Is their body out of control? So I argue very strongly for good assessment of strategies and representational models and information processing before I try to do anything. And that will help me to formulate the problem and decide where I want to go. So I don't have one answer for you. It's unique to each individual who comes in the door. Individualization. I know it's not possible with funding how it is. But it's what every troubled person didn't have in their childhood. No one saw them accurately as they were and worked with them in their ever-changing zone of proximal development. If we gave any gift to a client or a patient, it would be to tolerate them just the way they are so that they don't have to retell the story so that we can manage it, and then to help them in their zone of proximal development as we helped no one else ever before as if they were the one unique person that mattered. For our 50 minutes, yes, I know there is a limit. But it is the individualization, the individual's belief that you see them accurately in ways that they can recognize, and you're willing to accept that and work with them there, rather than asking that they fit into some textbook definition of what they should be. One, one comment. What really interests me about these round circular models is that when I try to teach them to psychotherapists, they immediately have patients come to mind. But when we go down and try to do the detailed assessment work, they get all confused. Oh, very, very difficult. However, if you show them to patients or clients, I work mostly in Europe, the patients, the clients here. Um, People put their finger on it immediately, that's me. And they're very often right. They very often understand what they're doing. And I remember well one person who said, can I be on both sides of the model? Can I be an A and a C? Yes, sweetheart, you can. <laughs> and that makes intervention complex. You need to help the person see. This intervention I'm giving now, this is for the a part of you, the inhibited part of you, the avoidant part of you, describe it how you want. This isn't for the reactive, over the top, because you've got to get them to funnel that intervention to the aspect of their functioning that it fits when they're AC combinations. Not unheard of. Um, I think you had a question. I was just going to say, so like with Cecilia, you know, um, I mean, you saw the video and all of that. Would you take kind of a psychoeducational approach to her? To like, I mean, you have now this conceptualization of what's going on with her. Would you share that with her in little bits or? Cecilia's a very particular case. Um, I do a lot of work for the courts and the court was deciding whether or not she could keep her child whom she had never abused or neglected. They took and put her into foster care with him at his birth because of her history. 
And I then did the AAI, and I got this um, video, and I did a parents interview where she talked about her parenting as opposed to her childhood. And I made the recommendation that she remain in this foster home longer than she wanted to, because I felt the foster mother there was excellent with her, but that she, the foster mother, thought she was there for the child. And my instructions were to reorient her to being a transitional attachment figure to Cecilia. Then I had a list of instructions for the services. Uh, I did mention contraception. That was on my list. You can't deal with two babies when you're not managing one too well. Um, but then I had directions for the services. They needed to back off. They needed to listen to her reasoning and support it any time that they could, as opposed to imposing their own plan. They needed to get out of the detail level of looking at how clean her room was and moving up to more important parenting things. So I sent out a plan for the foster parent, for Cecilia, and for the services. And in fact, I will be going back to England in about a week to follow up on this. So I wasn't doing actual treatment, and we didn't send her to treatment proper. She's 19. She's in the most productive period of life there is for making change. She's in the transition to adulthood. She's got almost an adult brain. It'll finish up around 35 years, but she's got most of it online now. 36 years, it starts dying, and then you look like me. Um, but. But she's got enough of it to think abstractly. She's out of her parents' home. I wanted to use her context and build on her own skills rather than plop her into therapy. So we didn't recommend that. I didn't recommend that. In the case of this woman at this particular moment in life with this son, etc. But that's a unique thing. I'm not saying that for every 19-year-old this is what you do. Thank you so much.